Welcome to Creation in the 21st Century. I'm your host, Carl Ball, founder and director of the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas. The title to today's program is Effective Speech. Now, isn't this a program of the Bible and creation science? Isn't this a program of evidence? Yes, it is. We today would like to observe together what effective speech consists of, what are the rules, and see if God has applied these rules in the creation of the universe, the disruption of his own perfectly orchestrated systems, and then the ultimate redemption of all that he has made that responds to him. I've been looking forward to this program. Many decades ago in high school, I remember speech instructor Ernest Sublett, marvelous, brilliant man who had taught in college and then in Abilene, Texas High School, he had transferred and I transferred to the school my last senior year. And that was providentially directed of God because Mr. Sublett was a master of speech instruction, speech and drama. And I remember the first day in class, he said to us, you're going to need to memorize the four rules for effective speech. And we did. And they have stood me in good stead all of these long decades. The first rule is effective speech is not for exhibition, but for communication. I'll go back to these in a few moments. The second rule is effective speech is disarming in its apparent spontaneity and artlessness. The third rule is, effective speech is often derived by signs of which the audience is unaware, from signs of which the audience is often unaware. And the fourth rule is, effective speech has for its ultimate end the winning of response. Now let's talk about those a few moments and then observe those on a cosmological scale and a terrestrial scale on planet Earth that we can observe because man has a marvelous capacity. The human brain is able to measure the distance to the farthest star, weigh the mass of the universe, interpret the signals therefrom, and come to a conclusion as to origin, and ultimate destiny involved in the entire cosmos. Now, let's get back to those rules of speech. And in fact, you might want to write those down because I think those are the most effective four rules that have affected my life. And hopefully I can pass on a blessing to you because you have information that should be communicated effectively. Rule number one is effective speech is not for exhibition, but for communication. That is, we're not to stand up with an affected tone and say, look how well I speak. Look how pretty I am. Look how majestic I have arrived. Instead, we're to come like Jesus did. Meek and lowly, we have no pomp or pageantry. He came to present himself as the king of the Jews, riding on a donkey, the foal of an ass. He was humble. He was born under humble circumstances, raised in a very humble home. When he was crucified, the garment, the only garment that he owned was gambled for. He is the master of demonstrating to us what it should be like. Number one, effective speech is not for exhibition, but for communication. Number two, Effective speech is disarming in its apparent spontaneity and artlessness. We're not to say, look how well I speak. We are instead to simply put everyone at ease and communicate what we've come to say. Number three, effective speech is often derived from signs of which the audience is often unaware. Sometimes it's the raise of an eyebrow. Sometimes it's a pause. Sometimes it's a change in the posture. 
But the audience subliminally picks up on a change in the speech pattern. And then number four, effective speech has for its ultimate end the winning of response. And may I say to you that the one who by his voice uttered the worlds into existence has for his ultimate end and purpose the winning of your response to him. Now, let's apply this on a cosmological, global, and universal scale. Speech is very important. Uh, the Bible says that the speech that we receive from the heavens literally embraces all of the distance of the stars and the galaxies, and there is no place on earth where their speech is not heard, Psalm 19. Literally, on earth, the speech of the heavens, the vibratory information coming in, affects all of planet earth. Now, the scripture states in Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them. Here we have two illustrations. One, of the beatific design we see on the surface of planet earth and all the host of the heavens, 225 billion galaxies, each comprised of over a half a billion stars. All of those are orchestrated with signals, and I'll describe that uh, additionally in a few moments. All of these actually send signals that are received. The, uh, the biorhythms of all living systems are affected by, and this is not astrology, this is literal astronomical data. The biorhythms of living systems are all affected by the vibrations of the heavens. So we have the speech of the heavens coming to us. But that speech, as important as it is, is only a reflection of the following. We have in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, the statement that the worlds were framed by the word of God. How is that possible? I received a call a few weeks ago from one of the world's leading physicists and mathematicians, David Otway Ray. Dr. Ray has two doctorates uh, from major universities. Dr. Ray was simultaneously a member of, even though he was American educated, a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, a member of four other Eastern Bloc Academies of Science, a member of the London Royal Society, the Academy of Science for the British Empire, a major scholar, and then he returned back to America and continued research. I received a call from him just weeks ago, and he was very excited, and I said, Dave, what's going on? He said, I've just confirmed mathematically and physically what other physicists had suggested in the past, but I've confirmed that everything we see, every physical dimension that we are, all the mass of the universe, the stellar bodies, the internal structure of planet Earth, the sun, the moon, the galaxies, every physical particle, every subatomic particle, is all the result of acoustical vibratory energy. Now, did you get that? Acoustical sound, vibratory energy. In fact, it's still vibrating. There's the three degree Kelvin background radiation, which is not the result of a Big Bang or the off scouring of evolutionary uh, dilatory processes, but instead it was found by Professor Simony, Hebrew University physicist, that at micro increments throughout the universe. There's a lattice work of electrons and positrons in concert vibration, and it is that concert vibration that provides the three degree background radiation. These electrons, these positrons, all subatomic particles, all atom, 